Welcome to the podcast for Westside A Jesus Church. We hope this teaching encourages and empowers you to love, learn, and live the way of Jesus. Uh, let's begin in Psalm chapter 23, and I'll, I'll read it to you, and then we'll get started. Oh, I remember. We have two book recommendations. Um, both of these are like incredible. Uh, first of all, Practice of the Presence of God. This is by Brother Lawrence. And uh, secondly, Celebration of Discipline by a guy named Richard Foster. Out of curiosity, has, has anyone read Celebration of Discipline? Okay, only a few, that's surprising. Um, if you haven't, repent, and then get a hold of it. I think we have some copies left at the book table, or you can go online and whatever, Amazon it, but uh, it's a fantastic book. It's literally impacted the lives of millions of people uh, throughout the world. Um, and kind of a fun fact with that book, Richard Foster wrote that book a few miles from here. Um, there's this little cabin in the woods that's like past Newburgh, and um, I, it's actually where I go many times to write our messages for Sunday. So I'll go there and just kind of hole up for a while and, and pray and, and write these messages. And I found out not too long ago that that cabin is actually the same spot where Richard Foster wrote that book, Celebration of Discipline. I say cabin, it's like a box. Like if you like tiny homes, you, you would love this place. It's absolutely tiny. You step inside, there's a door and a window and the presence of God. It's amazing. So anyway, celebration of discipline is so good. But Psalm 23, this is where we're at in this series. We're taking a deep dive into this psalm. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Um, I don't know if you guys have been following what's been happening on the big island of Hawaii. Uh, there, there's this volcano, uh, Mount Kilauea, and over the last few weeks, um, it's actually been, been erupting. So lava has been spilling out all over the island. Um, it's like s destroying uh, homes. Um, people, thousands of people have actually had to, to flee that part of the island. And so over the last few weeks, I've been watching this because my wife and I was over here. Uh, we lived in Hawaii uh, for about eight years. Um, we lived on the island of Maui. And uh, so the big island, is you can actually see it on clear days. It's right there. So we've been watching it because it kind of affects people that we know on the Hawaiian islands. And as I've been reading about volcanoes, my goodness, it's, it's fascinating how it all works. Now, you probably all know this, but you have the magma, right? The, the malted rock underneath the surface. And then when that pressure builds to a certain point, it begins to break through the crust of the earth. It, it begins to split apart rocks or melt rocks. And then it finds ways, little fissures, little ruptures in the earth, earth's crust. And, and then lava begins to spill out. Uh, here, here's a picture of... Uh, a recent picture that was taken, uh, looking down, and you can see this fissure that's opened up, and there's been over two dozen of these things. So can you imagine living right there, and homes are being burned. Uh, a guy just last week, I think, uh, a, a piece of lava actually flew out and hit his leg. Now, the guy, uh, he, he survived, his leg didn't, and, and so it's crazy what these things can do. Fortunately, no one has actually lost their lives. But it's intriguing to me that as I look at this picture, and I've been preparing this, this sermon series, it struck me that that is so much what can happen in our lives too. What do I mean? Well, every single one of us, we have a side to us that people see. But then right beneath the surface, we're, we're facing battles. Uh, there's pressure, there's tension, there's things that we're wrestling with. Maybe it's stuff from your past. Maybe it's some addiction to sin. Maybe it's drama in a relationship. Maybe it's the attacks of the enemy. Maybe it's just discouragement because you're a Cavaliers fan. Like you, you fill in the blank. 
And we all have like this pressure that's growing within us, this tension that, that's inside of us. And what can happen is that if we don't address that, if we don't look at what's happening in our soul, if we're not healthy inwardly, that then sooner or later, just like that mountain, cracks begin to form in our integrity. There's fissures, there's, there's fractures, and, and all the stuff that's within us, if it's not dealt with in a, in a healthy, life-giving way, well, then it finds ways to come out of us. Um, there's this great quote uh, by a guy named Peter uh, Shizero, and he said, people will shipwreck or live inconsistent lives because of forces and motivations beneath the surface of their lives, which they have never even considered. I mean, how many of us, we know people, I, I know a ton of people in this camp where you get a call out of the blue and you're like, oh, did you hear about Bill? And you're like, no, what happened? Because Bill outwardly looks really successful. Outwardly, Bill seems to have it all together. He has a great family or he's just a godly person. And they're like, did you hear about Bill? What happened? Well, he just left his wife or he just walked with God, or he or walked away from God, or he just had this breakdown. And, and you're like shocked. Like of all people, I would never, ex now if your name's Bill, I'm not talking about you. Maybe I am, maybe it's like the word of the Lord. Um, <laughs> and now how does that happen, right? Have you, have you ever been surprised by someone, a spiritual leader even, you're like, what? I had no idea that was going on. What was going on? There was things underneath the surface just like Mount Kilauea, things that, that haven't been addressed. There, there's unhealth there, and, and it inevitably finds a way to come out of us. And you see, Westside family, this is why this series matters. This is why what we're doing in Psalm 23, a deep dive into the words of David and the words of the Lord, is because we need to have, have healthy souls. If our souls are unhealthy, then the rest of our life will lack integrity. But if our souls are flourishing and in sync and connected with God, then the rest of our lives, our trajectory, our decisions, our relationships, how we do life, that will be healthy too. So last week, if you miss it, by the way, go online, check it out, because I laid the foundation and I mentioned how each week we're going to, over the next six weeks, look at a different way that our, our souls can be restored. And today I want to begin with, I think, what is the most vital, and that is our soul is restored through intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. If you have your Bibles um, open, would you look back down with me in, in verse 1? Um, notice how David begins the psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, the word shepherd, if you're a note taker, grab a pen, piece of paper. The word shepherd in the Hebrew language, this is the language of the Old Testament, is the word ra'ah. Um, can I hear you say ra'ah? <laughs> Sounds like a Katy Perry song. <laughs> you're going to hear me ra'ah, right? It means protector or provider or friend. Th this is... This is language of, of intimacy. This is what you need to know, is that shepherds in the ancient world, and there were many, to be a shepherd, it wasn't just a nine to five. You, you wouldn't just punch the clock, okay, I'm done. No, if you were a shepherd 3,000 years ago when this was written, it was your whole life. You ate with your sheep, you hung out with your sheep, you named your sheep, you even slept at night in the same area as your sheep. In fact, did you know that, that shepherds in the ancient world, when it was time to go to bed, they put their sheep inside a pen, which was generally just basically a little fence, and then the shepherd would lay down in front of that pen. Why? Well, first of all, because he didn't want any sheep to escape. Um, <laughs> sheep aren't the smartest animals which makes it fascinating to me that God calls us his sheep. Uh, that's a whole other sermon. <laughs> and so he is lying there, because I, I don't want you guys to get out, but he's also lying there to protect his sheep, right? Wolves and predators and others who have come to steal, kill and destroy. And so the shepherd would become the door, in a sense, to keep the sheep safe. Isn't it fascinating in John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And then in that chapter, he also says, I am the door. 
the shepherd would literally become the door for the sheep, protecting the sheep, laying his life down for the sheep, keeping the sheep safe. So this is language that speaks of closeness. He, he doesn't say, the Lord is my sheep dog, right? Think about a sheep dog. A, a sheep dog, sure, can, can maybe do the job of a shepherd in some ways, but it, it does it in a totally different way. Nips at your heels, barks, gets you in line. Did you know that there is a difference between a sheepdog and a shepherd. And, and David, when he writes this, he's like, God, you're way more than just a sheepdog. You're, you're not just trying to keep me in line. You, you're actually my shepherd. You care for me. You, you love me. When I'm hurt, when I'm wounded, when my soul is crushed, God, you're, you're there for me. And this is why he uses this language. Look down in verse two. He says, he makes me to lie down. In green pastures, he, he leads me beside quiet waters. Here's another fun fact about shepherding in the ancient world. If your sheep was frightened for some reason, agitated or confused or anxious, you know what the shepherd would do? He would take that sheep, lead it gently away from the rest of the flock, bring it to a quiet place, green pastures, still waters. Um, the word lead here, nahal in the, in the Hebrew language, it speaks of leading gently by the hand. So, so the shepherd's not like kicking the sheep, get in line, get out of here. No, takes that sheep gently by the hand, let me bring you to a place of rest. Oh, here's some green pastures, here's some still waters. And, and that shepherd would then gently, with his hand, cause that sheep to lie down. It's gonna be okay. You're gonna be all right. And this is why the very next verse says, he restores my soul. Last week I mentioned the word restore is much closer to the original if you have the NIV. King James, I think, in this case gets it right. He restores my soul. He puts me back together. Um, we also mentioned last week this word soul. He restores my soul. In the Hebrew is the word nefesh. And nefesh, it means the deepest part of you that longs to connect with God. The deepest part of you that longs to connect with God. But here's something I found out recently, and I didn't share this last week. I wanted to, but I didn't. The word nefesh comes from another Hebrew word, nefesh. So you have nefesh and you have nefesh. What does nefesh mean? Nefesh means to take a deep breath. In fact, let's just do that right now. As a church, count of three, deepest possible breath. One, two, three, go. How does that feel? It's good, right? Just think about you work out, you go for a run, you stop. Or maybe you're a swimmer, right? And you come up for air. It's restoration, it's... It's healing, it's, it's renewal. You know, I, I used to live in the South Pacific for three years on this, in this island called Vanuatu, and there, there's no Costco there, there's no 23rd there. We're literally in the jungle, and if you wanna eat, you have to go catch your food. <laughs> so every single night, the guys that we lived with, I was teaching at this little school, the, the guys that we lived with in the jungle would go out and they'd grab these spears and they would go spear fishing and, and they would invite me along and I'd go with them and I was absolutely the worst fisherman ever. I, in three years, I never caught anything with the exception of one little fish that is about this size and that's a whole nother story, I had to throw it back, right? But they took me and it was incredible. These guys would swim down 70, 80 feet sometimes, holding their breath, and they would catch the most bizarre fish imaginable. In fact, on my Instagram list last week, I uh, posted a, this picture that I found of uh, these weird fish. Someone's like, you gotta share this. So here it is, kind of embarrassing, it's an old picture. But look at these fish, they're absolutely bizarre creepy, and I didn't catch that one. They're like, here, you need something to hold for the photo, <laughs> right? <laughs> and and the, one of the reasons why, I just didn't, I couldn't hold my breath that long. So I, I would go down like 20 feet or whatever, and I'd swim around for a few seconds. I'm like, oh, that's enough. And I go up to the surface of the water, <gasps> right? It's this dramatic thing. And they're like, white man can't fish, white man can't fish. That's what they call me. So embarrassing. <laughs> just think of that moment when you're 
head breaks through the surface of the water. <gasps> Restoration, healing, it's nafash. And this is the word that David uses to describe that this process of soul keeping, how God wants to, to renew you, how God wants to restore you. Uh, you could write down if you're a note taker, when he says he restores my soul, it literally means, check this out, he will return my breath to me. Isn't that beautiful? Because that's what I'm longing for. And I know you are too. Like we all come in here like feeling like we've been running a marathon all week. We're tired, we're exhausted, we're beat up, we're, we're worn down, our, our souls are hurting, we're juggling all this stuff. God, I need you to return my breath to me. I, I need you to heal me. I need you to restore me. It's this language of intimacy, our good shepherd guiding us, leading us, causing us to lay down. Here, here's your breath back. And what I love about Psalm 23, and we don't have time to go into all of it because we're gonna do baptisms in a few minutes, but what I love about Psalm 23 is we see this language all over the place. Shepherd, leads, breath, you are with me. Goodness and mercy will follow me. God's heart for you is that like the shepherd with the sheep who knows his sheep, who cares for his sheep, there's friendship, there's intimacy, God's heart for you is that you would experience intimacy with him too. It's how the Bible begins, in fact. Genesis says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then on the sixth day, God created male and female, and then you go to Genesis chapter two, verse seven. This is so worth writing down. It says, he formed Adam from the dust, and he breathed into him the breath of life. Check this out. And Adam became a living what? Soul. By the way, Bible nerds, uh, this is the first time you see the word soul in the Bible. The very first time. Nefesh. God gave Adam his nefesh. Now, question, where did Adam get his nefesh from? How did he get his nefesh? God breathed it into him. Fascinating. Do you realize breathing on someone is one of the most intimate or awkward things you could possibly do, <laughs> right? If I get off the stage and I'm like super close to you and you can feel my breath, that's just bizarre. I, I don't think I wanna go to this church anymore, right? <laughs> if, if you're close enough to someone that you can feel their breath or worse, smell their breath, right? If you're close enough like that, you're either married or about to be, right? <laughs> it's this language of intimacy and closeness. God breathed on the first humans and their soul came alive. What Adam experienced and what the Bible is telling us here is that, check this out, your soul began as the breath of God. Your soul, the deepest part of you, began as the breath of God. It's connected to God. It's a part of who he is, pouring himself out into you. So what does that mean? God breathes on us. Our soul came alive. So when our soul is winded and tired and exhausted and lonely and discouraged, what we need more of is the breath of God. What we need more of is to experience God. And, and if our soul is gasping for air, what, this is God's way of saying, it's because I I wanna breathe into you new life and hope and peace and fulfillment, but, but you're not close enough for me to do that, to feel someone's breath that requires intimacy. And for some of us, we feel winded and exhausted because we haven't been intimate and close with God. And this is what makes the Genesis story so tragic because Adam and Eve, they sinned, they, they ate of the tree. And, and then what's the very first thing that happens after the fall of, of humanity? God asks a question. By the way, it's the very first question in all the Bible and it's a question I think that has still gone unanswered. What was the question? God said, Adam, where are you? Now, God 
he, he's God, he, he knows everything. So it's not because he didn't quote know, but it was because God was yearning for intimacy and relationship with Adam because they used to walk together in the cool of the day. When you walk with someone, it's not just about the walk, it's about the person that you're with. There's fellowship, you open your heart, they open their heart, there's a closeness, there's a bond. It takes time, it's a beautiful thing. Adam and God would walk together in the cool of the day and when Adam fell, when Eve ate of the fruit, the one repercussion that was by far the most significant was a broken relationship. Adam, it's our time, man. This is when we walk together in the cool of the day. And you can hear the broken heart of a father, of a shepherd saying, where, where are you? Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. In the words of John Steinbeck, we now live east of Eden. But what I love about the God of the Bible is, check this out, God left the garden too. <laughs> the Bible story doesn't say Adam and Eve left and God kicked him out and that was the end of it and God stayed in Eden, okay, this is my place, don't ever come back. No, what you see in the Old Testament is that God, the shepherd, the king, the one who loved and created all things, he stepped out of the garden too and pursued his children. There's one poet who, who says that God is, quote, the hound of heaven. He chases after Adam and Eve. He chases after his people. And so when they went to Egypt, what does God do? He shows up and sets them free. When their backs were to the Red Sea, God shows up and splits it in half. When they're lo lonely and lost in a desert, God shows up in power and glory. The story of scripture over and over again is a shepherd who is pursuing his sheep, leaving the 99 to come after the one lost lamb. This is what we need to get, is that when, it, when we talk about intimacy with God, this is more than anything else. This is God's heart for you. The king of creation, the, the one who made all things, actually wants to have a relationship with you. I mean, think about that. The, the God who made Trillium Lake and Cannon Beach and Nebula and Trout and, and beautiful mountains and golden doodles, this God who, who made all things, he's like, I wanna be in relationship with you. Where are you? Where are you? For some of us, that's the question the Spirit of God is speaking into our hearts right now. I, my heart aches to, to show you stuff. I, I long to reveal things to you, God says. Where, where are you? And you need to know too, not only is this what our God longs for, it's what you long for. The deepest you, the real you, isn't thirsty for the distractions of our world. The deepest you, your soul, your nefesh, your nefash, is craving intimacy with God. We wanna breathe deeply and have our souls rest restored. This is why Jesus, our, our good shepherd in John chapter four, he met a woman at the well who was thirsty for water, but she was more than thirsty for water, she was thirsty for the waters that only God can give. And Jesus shows up and he's like, uh, I can give you water. If you drink of this stuff, you're gonna thirst again, but if you drink of the water I give you, you will never thirst again. And her reaction is like, oh sweet, that sounds amazing. Give me some of that water so I don't have to keep coming back to this well anymore. She totally missed it. And Jesus is like, okay, let's go deeper. Go get your husband. And her response was, well, I don't got a husband. And Jesus says, well, technically you're right because you've had five husbands and you're sleeping around with a guy who's not your husband. But I guess you, you said the truth there. Technically you're right. Talk about an awkward moment, right? And her response was, sir, I perceive you are a prophet, which is just a brilliant way of changing the conversation and sounding spiritual. <laughs> and so she gets her husband, she comes back, and it was a beautiful thing that happened. Why did Jesus ask her, go get your husband? Here's why. Because he wanted her to be real about the ache and loneliness that was in her heart. God, 
can't bless the fake you. (laughs) Intimacy with God means naked, raw vulnerability. It's when we come just as we are in our wounds and our longing in our loneliness and say, God, I'm gasping for air and I need you. And what we find is a shepherd who leads us to green pastures and still waters. But it raises a question for me, and I think it's a huge one. If this is the longing of our heart, how do we step into this? Richard Foster, in his book on discipleship, he has this amazing quote. He says, don't you feel a tug a yearning to sink down into the silence and solitude of God? Don't you long for something more? Doesn't every breath crave a deeper, fuller exposure to his presence? That's us. God, I want this more than anything. That's that's what I need. My heart thirsts for the living God. I want to know God. I want to experience the intimacy that maybe, maybe you once had it five years ago, but it's like the fire's gone out. Maybe 10 years ago, you were breathing in and out the presence of God, but now you just feel like an empty, hollow shell. How do we get back to this place of encounter with the God who made all things? Now, we could talk about so much here. We could talk about prayer. We could talk about the importance of worship. Uh, We could talk about time. There's no intimacy without time. We could talk about the importance of doing what you're all doing today, coming to church and letting your soul be restored. Trust me, there's like seven sermons in this one point, but I won't go there. Because I want to share one thing before we open up the waters. And to me, this is a game changer. If you want to just write it down. It's a super simple thought. But for me, this, this has actually transformed my relationship with God, and I, I want to share it with you. How, how do we experience intimacy with God? Here's how. Intimacy with God begins right now. Intimacy with God begins right now. Jesus put it this way in in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. He says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Do you know the word abide that Jesus uses there? It speaks of someone who's at home. Have you ever gone over to someone's house, and you just automatically feel at home there? You just feel so welcomed. You can show up unannounced. It's like, no big deal. Hey, come on in. Relax. Here's something to drink. Here's some food. And, And you just feel like it's part of your family. But on the flip side, have you ever been over to someone's house and you feel just so awkward? Like you show up even though you were invited, but you still feel unwelcome. And you walk in and everything is so immaculate and perfect. You don't want to touch anything, right? Jesus, when he says abide, it it literally means you're at home with God. Put up your feet. Relax. Enjoy his presence. And notice (laughs) that Jesus He doesn't give us a long list of requirements saying, okay, here's all the things you have to do to experience intimacy with me. No, that's called religion. What religion says, you want to be intimate with the divine? This is what you got to do. Light the right candles, say the right prayers, pray the right mantras, stare at your belly button long enough. Then maybe, then you can experience enlightenment or nirvana or whatever. Jesus doesn't do that. He says, actually, right now, wherever you're sitting, You can experience the presence of God. Abide in me and I will abide in you. Intimacy starts now. John Ortberg in his book on soul keeping, I mentioned last week, he said, God wants you to focus on him, to be with him. Abide in me. Just relax. I love this. And learn to enjoy his presence. Every day is a collection of moments. 86,400 seconds in a day. How many of them can you live with God? Start where you are and grow from there. God wants to be with you every moment. You see, the problem sometimes when we talk about the presence of God isn't that God is so far away. It's that God is so close, but we don't even realize. God's like the air that we breathe, but we don't notice. Every second, 86,400 seconds, every second is an opportunity for you. This week, starting right now, today, 
is a moment for you to experience the presence of God, to have intimacy with God. I, I know, because some of you have been walking with the Lord for a while, I know that in this room, some of you right now are there. It's like you're encountering the spirit. You're in prayer. You're listening to these words. You're praying over people in the gathering. You're praying, God, just don't let Dom go too long today. Like, I know these prayers, right? You're experiencing that, that closeness and, and fellowship. But it's not just a church thing. This is something that you can carry with you into the mundane, boring moments, everyday moments of life. You know, one practice that I've recently put into action, and it's actually been really good. I was telling my wife yesterday about this. When I, when I wake up in the morning, typically, what, what, what do most of us do? First thing when you wake up, you reach for your phone, you turn it on, you check your mail, you look at your text messages, and for me at least, I, I would look at the news. That was like my first thing. And then I read all about these horrible things that are happening in the world, and I wonder why I feel so bummed out when I get up. Talk about getting off on the wrong foot. And so lately what I've been doing, and it's been so good and so healing for me, is before I even check any of that, is just open my Bible and read a psalm. Just laying there, just still in bed, okay, read the psalm. And it's like these words are so refreshing and so healing, and it doesn't have to take long. You could do it in a two or three or four minutes, and just let these words sink into your heart. Every moment is an opportunity to experience the presence of God. You're standing in line at, at Costco. And again, what does everyone do now when they stand in line? Reach their phone, check the score, look at Facebook or whatever. I do that. But what would it look like instead of reaching for the phone and getting distracted and not being fully present to actually say, you know what? I'm here with all these people who are staring at their phones. I wanna pray for them. What if you just took this time? Lord, I pray your favor and blessing on me. I'm not talking about in the name of Jesus, right? You could do that. That would be an awkward moment at Costco. Who knows? Maybe revival would break out. It would be incredible. I'm just talking about like in your heart. Lord, I wanna, I wanna pray for these people whatever struggles they're going through. Intimacy with God starts now. You're having a stressful day at work. There's tension with a coworker. You're like, ah, what do I do? Before you say something you regret, what would it look like for you to say, I'm gonna step outside. I'm gonna find a quiet spot somewhere. Maybe the only quiet spot you could find is your car and you just sit in your car and you're like, okay, God, I need to be here with you. And you don't even have to say anything. Just breathe in and out his presence. Be mindful of his presence that is there with you in your car. You're driving in your car. You're going back home. You're stuck in traffic, perhaps. And instead of just getting angry or irritated or annoyed, what if you took that moment of driving to say, God, I want to connect with you? You start praying. You put on a good album. You start singing. About a month ago, I did this, and it, it was interesting. It was one of those kind of fascinating hard days at work, and I'm getting in my car, driving downtown for a meeting, and I'm like, I got to get my soul in the right place. So I put on the song, and it was so good that I, I start singing in the car. Your car can turn into a cathedral, by the way. And so I started singing, and I was like really into it. And I just, you, you know what I'm talking about. There's something about worship music that just is life for your soul. So I'm singing, and I'm worshiping. Well, I got so into it, and the traffic had sped up a little bit, but I really hadn't. <laughs> so I'm going like 30 when I should have been going 60. And what I didn't <laughs> realize is there was this guy behind me who's like trying to get around me. And I was just so into this song that finally he finds a way to get next to me and then he slows down real quick and he looks at me and I look at him and he flipped me off. <laughs> um, it was actually Phil uh, yeah, <laughs> who did that. <laughs> no, just kidding. Now, isn't it interesting how you can have this epic encounter with the living God and it's like the enemy's right there, he wants to rob your joy. Count on it, it's gonna happen. So I'm like there worshiping the next thing, what? <laughs> and so what do I do, right? I'm a pastor. I flipped him off too. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. I did not. I get to see the emails. <laughs> no, I prayed for him. I'm like, Lord, just judge him right now. In the name of Jesus. Just <laughs> The 
There's this poet, um, <laughs> from that, the bird to poetry. Uh, there's this poet, her name is Elizabeth Browning. Check out this, it's one of my favorite all time poems. She said, earth is crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. Moses was a shepherd. And for 40 years, he's in the boring wilderness with a bunch of boring, dumb sheep. And one day, he sees a bush on fire. Oh, that's a change. And then the bush talked. That's really a change. And it was God. Moses, take off your sandals because the place you're standing on is what? Holy ground. What? You're, you're kidding me. Moses would have thought, this is where I worked, <laughs> right? This is the ground I've walked. I know it like the back of my hand. Sheep, they walk on here. I, it's dusty, it's dirty, it's mundane, it's boring. And God said, no, it's holy. Take off your sandals. When we realize that every moment is infused with the presence of God, we learn the art of taking off our sandals and being still and mindful of his presence. And we get our breath. Every moment is holy ground. Raising your kids, it's holy ground. Your singleness, it's holy ground. Your job, it's holy ground. Salt and straw, it's holy ground. <laughs> Every moment, and we can go from this place and say, God, Intimacy starts now. I want to live into that. Breathing in and out. The air, the nafash, your presence. And I'm taking off my sandals, God, because I don't want anything to get in between you and me. Even an inch, I'm taking it off and I'm sinking my toes into holiness. You'll get your breath back. And like David, you'll say, he restores my soul.